Well, good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year to you all <laughs> as we begin the new year. You may follow along using the insert in the bulletin to, for the notes, if that helps you out. And we'll be in the book of 1 Chronicles 29, 1 Chronicles 29. Well, let's take a look at, uh, I want to start by telling uh, this story. In a church, the preacher was moving toward the end of his sermon, and with growing crescendo, he said, the church, like the crippled man, has got to get up and walk. And the congregation responded, that's right, Reverend, let it walk. And he added, this church, like Elijah on Mount Carmel, has got to run. Run, let it run, preacher, let it run. The church, this church has got to mount up on wings like eagles and fly. Let it fly, preacher, let it fly. Then he added, now if this church is going to fly, it's going to take money. Let it walk, preacher. <laughs> A man called at the church and asked if he could speak to the head hog at the trough. And the secretary said, who? The man replied, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. Sure, now that she had heard him correctly, the secretary said, Sir, if you mean our pastor, you will have to treat him with more respect and ask for the reverend or the pastor. But certainly you cannot refer to him as the head hog of the trough. At this, at this the man came back. Oh, I see. Well, I was going to donate. I have $50,000, and I, wanted to, I was thinking of donating to the building fund. The secretary said, Hold the line. I think the big pig just walked through the door. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you teach us. And I pray that we will be men and women who give, who are effective at giving, and who do it because we love you. Not out of of coercion or anything like that, but simply because we love you. So Lord, guide us in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the tendencies that money can do for people or to people is that it can make them attractive. It is very easy to buy services, but you can't buy love. You can have people wait on you hand and foot, but when it comes to love, that is something no one can buy. It has to be given, not taken. You see, money exposes our human nature. It exposes who we truly are as people. In James chapter 2, we read this in verses 1 through 4. We read this warning. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, the attitudes we have can be swayed by how we discriminate against people in terms of their financial status. We tend to look at what people can offer us rather than how we can serve through Christ. When Christ walked this earth, he consistently made himself available to the people who were marginalized, who were forgotten, or simply cast aside because they were poor, they were filthy, they were hungry, they were hurting. Christ said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. And and those on the right, the sheep said, when did we see you naked in prison, hungry or thirsty? Then Jesus said in Matthew 25, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. He used the word the least. The least means those who in society are not important, forgotten, marginalized. It's easy to forget them, to not care, because it takes much to care. It takes much energy to involve people who are the least, if you will, in your lives. Then you realize we are the least when it comes to holiness, righteousness, love, servanthood, etc., God took great effort to save us, to heal us, and to love us. He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to set us free, to send the Holy Spirit to fill us so we can live the empowered lives. And He created the church so we could have community, uh, so that we could serve each other, and we could challenge the evil of this evil age. We are to be a contrast society, a contrast community that acts in a manner that challenges the status quo, the 
immorality of this evil age and offer to the least of this world a place of community, family, and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. A contrast society means we are a church that thinks differently. We do not see the world as the world sees. We do not act in a manner that the world acts. We live the transformed, spirit-filled lives. We are a new creation in Christ. We now see the world as God sees it. We mourn and pound the table over what breaks God's heart. We love what he loves and hate what he hates. We offer Christ since God offered Christ to us. Our very nature has been changed and transformed by the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. The overwhelming beauty and love of Christ has manifested himself through us by faith in the finished work of God's Holy Son. Because of this, we now live in a new reality, one that challenges the false perceptions of what the world calls normal and true. We expose the sins of this evil age, and we offer the beauty and love of Christ. Because of this, we now no longer go after the things that this world offers and entices us, for we have been captured by Christ. We now go after what Christ has called us to do. Let us see the world as God sees it. Let the transforming work of the Holy Spirit give eyes to see and hearts to love and hands that give and feet that go. I challenge you today, live in the power of God's transformative love. Live in the power of God's transformative love. Let it transform you, change you, shape you, bless you. You know, in 1 Chronicles 28 and 29, David, the king of Israel, is old. And he knows that his days are short. He summons all the officials of the land to join him at Jerusalem. He was going to fundraise for the temple. And as you know, in any good fundraising effort, you've got to give a speech. So he gives a speech. Now, the life of David is well chronicled in Scripture. He gets the most press of all the kings. His story begins in 1 Samuel 16 and goes all the way through to 2 Samuel until 1 Kings even. He also has all, uh, uh, he has all the narratives of 1 Chronicles that begins in chapter 10. He is the standard by which kings are to be measured. He is the one who loved God, who was humble before God, and who is known as a man after God's own heart. He did not do everything well as he took Bathsheba as his wife, even though she was married and then had her husband killed. But what made him stand out in the midst of that is that he humbled himself and he, and he, and he sought forgiveness. He repented a, 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 to God. Most kings would have taken that prophet who would have told him, you sin, and killed him. <laughs> but instead, he falls before God and seeks God's forgiveness. We know that David struggled with his children, first with Tamar and Ammon, and then Absalom. He even had a flea for his life as his son Absalom uh, took over the kingdom for a short period of time. Earlier on in his career as king, he noticed something, though. As a king, he noticed something was wrong. Here he lived in a palace. Here he lived in something great. But God's place uh, was a tent. God had a tent. He had a palace. Something seemed wrong, and something wasn't right. So he said, I'll build God a temple and remove the tent. God acknowledged David's heart, so he blessed him, saying, This kingdom will always have Someone sitting on the throne who's from from you. Someone will always sit on the throne who's from you. And he blessed him with a legacy. He blessed him with a future. He blessed him with the reality that God was in his life. He blessed him by saying, your son will always sit on the throne. But in the midst of that blessing, God said to David that you're not going to build me a temple. But your son will. God would not have David build this temple because of what we read in 2 Chronicles. David had heard the Lord tell him, and this is what it says in 22.8, 1 Chronicles 22.8, You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. This is also repeated in 1 Chronicles 28. The blood that David had shed made it inappropriate for him to be the builder of the temple. He had to secure the peace of the kingdom through warfare, and once it was secured, then his son Solomon was able to rule without threat 
or need for war. The temple was to be built with hands that knew no war. Although David could not build the temple, he was still a man who was transformed by the love and presence of God. He had seen the hand of God provide for him, take care of him. So instead of building the temple, he said, I'll raise all the things that you need to build the temple. I'll I'll gather all the materials. I'll raise all the money. I'll get all the timber. I'll get all the gold. I'll get all the silver. Whatever it needs to be built, I'll get it, even though I can't build it. And that's what he did. He sought the material. He raised what was needed. He gave all that he had because he was living in the transformative power of God's love. First thing. Give to God because you've been transformed by God. Give to God because you've been transformed by God. Let's look at 29 verses 1 through 9 of 1 Chronicles. Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because this palatial structure is not for man but for the Lord God. With all my resources I have provided for the temple of my God, gold for the work for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the word wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all these in large quantities. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God, over and above everything I provided for this holy temple. Three thousand talents of gold, gold of offer, and seven thousand talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings, for the gold work and of the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? Then the leaders of the families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave toward the work of the temple of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And And any who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in the custody of Jael the Gershonite. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. You know, John Raskus went to church and heard the pastor preach from Matthew 6. And in Matthew 6, is about the treasures in heaven. And as the offering plate was passed, John put in $300, and he softly said, I'll see you in heaven. And those around him said, oh, John is getting senile. He says he's going to see that $300 in heaven. He may meet his maker over there, but he certainly won't meet his money. Well, now the treasurer used some of that $300 to pay the electric bill. He gave some to the preacher to buy gasoline. Some went to the ministerial students and some to the mission field. Early one morning, John Raskus died in his sleep. And on the first day in, in, in glory, he walked down those streets of gold And a young fellow came up and said, Thank you, Brother John. I was cold and lonely, and it was a dark night. I saw the lights of the church just to get out of the dark. I went in. While there, the darkness left my soul, and I found Jesus. Another came to him and said, The preacher came to the filling station. As I filled his tank, he told me about Jesus, and I gave my heart to the Lord. Next, John went through a throng of people who said, I want to thank you for those ministerial students you helped. They preached the gospel to my family, and they found the Lord. He next met those of strange tongues who said, Thank you, brother, for sending us the gospel across the seas. John certainly did see his money in heaven. I tell you, live in the power of God's transformative love. You know, as I look at this passage in First Chronicles 29, I see David standing before all of his officials, leaders, and advisors. He knows that his son will soon be king, and the construction of the temple will soon begin. But let me ask you, if you're going to build the house of God, if you're going to build a temple for God, how would you build it? What materials would you use? How expensive would you go? In the end, it would still be a building, wouldn't it? Even Solomon, after the temple was built and he consecrated the building, he said this in in 1 Kings. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much, this, this, how much less this temple I have built. This was a nice building, a great structure that gave a glimpse of God's greatness. But it was still a building. The real demonstration is not how beautiful the building was, but the relationship and the obedience of the people to God. That was the true structure. 
They were the true demonstration of God's love and transformative power. Our giving to God may, be t- may at times be a reflection of God's greatness, possibly in the size of the gift. But in reality, the greatest demonstration of God's power is our relationship with him and our obedience to him. So let's make some observations. Number one, David gave God his best. He gave him his best. You know, as we read this, his gift is a reflection of the gratefulness and gratitude that he has toward God. He gave everything he had in this gift because he was committed to the ongoing vision of God's work and the transformative power both in his life and the lives of his sons that would come after him and his future grandsons, the future kings that would come from him. He wanted them to look at this place and remember the devotion and to live in the duty to, uh, to live and the duty to obey. David wanted the, the, his best in this project. He said, my son is young and inexperienced, and he was. He was a young man, not ready, probably not well known and not really able to uh, be king. And he said, my son is young and experienced. This task is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. And it's going to take everybody, not just Solomon. It's going to take everybody, not just one man. It's for God, not man. It's to show off God. You must show off God in your lives. You and I together are that palatial structure, the image of God, the manifestation of his presence on this earth. So let God shine through us. Second observation, David expected others to give their best. He says, I'm giving my best, I expect you to give your best. You know, when David stood before his officials and he showed them what he gave, he said, look at what I'm giving, all this gold, all this silver, all this bronze, even my own personal stuff, I'm giving it all. I mean, it's a big show. Could you imagine if we had an offering and said, okay, let's everyone show what you give. (laughs) But that's what David was doing. He said, I'm giving it all. I'm putting it all in. And it was for the purpose of inspiring. He, so, he stood before his officials and he showed them what he gave. He said he gave with all of his resources. Then he listed what he gave, gold, uh, bronze, silver, uh, iron, and wood, as well as other met- metals and materials. On top of that, he gave out of his own personal resources that he had, above and beyond what he gave prior, so the temple could be built. He was not saying what he was giving so that he could be ostentatious and proud, but rather to inspire so others would give. He then said, now who's willing to consecrate himself to the Lord today? In his expectation of giving, it was rooted in devotion and holiness unto God. What David understood was that this endeavor could not happen and would not happen if he was the only one who gave. This had to be a community effort. Everyone was to be part of this endeavor. Everyone was to take part in giving to the cause. When the whole community works together, people are blessed, and giving is accomplished. In 29.6, it says, Then the leaders of the families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of king's work gave willingly. They gave willingly. The people saw the generosity of the king, and it became attractive. We can be inspired by the giving of others. Look at 29.9. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders. The people rejoiced because their leaders gave freely and wholeheartedly. When giving becomes part of our DNA of, uh, of the leadership, it becomes attractive and infectious. Our giving is rooted in how we view the greatness and majesty of our God. As our God generously has given to us, we become men and women who generously give to others. The transformative lifestyle when lived out in the community, is demonstrated in the generosity and the giving of the people we see. We want to be known as a church that is generous, a community that is generous. Let us be a generous people, inspiring others to give. I challenge you, live in the transformative power of God's love. Secondly, give to God because he's sovereign. In 1 Chronicles 10 through 13, this is David's prayer. This is David prays the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, 
from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and, and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. You know, a young, na- a young man named William left home at 16 years of age to seek his fortune and everything that he owned in the world he carried in a bundle that he carried with him. Just a small little bag, everything he owned. But as he walked along on his way to the city, he met an old neighbor, the captain of a canal boat, and the words the old man spoke to him on that day stayed with him his entire life. Well, William, what are you, what are you doing? Where are you going? Asked the canal boat captain. I don't know. Father's too poor to keep me. He says, you know, can't stay home any longer. and I have to go make a living for myself now. William went on to say that he had no skills. That he didn't know any, uh, how to do anything except make soap and, and candles. Well, said the old man, let me pray with you and give you a little advice. There in the pathway, the two of them, a teenager and an old man, knelt down, and the man prayed earnestly for William. Then rising up, the boat captain said this, Someone will soon be the leading soap maker in New York City. Can be you as well as anyone. I hope it may be. Be a good man. Give your heart to Christ. Give the Lord all that belongs to him. Every dollar you earn. Make an honest soap. Give a full pound. And I'm certain you'll be prosperous and rich. Well, William arrived in New York. He had trouble finding a job, but he followed the old man's advice. He dedicated himself to Christ. He joined a church. He began worshiping there. And the first things he did with the first dollar is he earned was to give 10% of it to the Lord. And from that point on, he considered every 10 cents of every dollar as sacred to the Lord. In fact, he soon began giving 20 to the Lord. Then he raised it to 30, then to 40, then to 50. And late in his life, he had become successful. That He devoted his entire salary his yearly salary, 100% to the Lord. And even today, this, this very morning, nearly 200 years later, some of you may have brushed your teeth or washed your face with the products that he manufactured. His name was William Colgate. After David gave, after David gave, he and his officials gave, and then the nation gave. He worshiped and prayed. And in this praise, he acknowledged who God is. The truth of what we know and who we are and what we are are capable of is rooted in the truth that God is holy, God is sovereign, and God is our creator. We exist because he is our God. We live because he is life. We make decisions because God is sovereign. We experience love, relationship, and community because God is our Lord. Let's make some observations. Number one, God is worthy of our worship. You know, when David praises God by watching the people give, he recognizes that God is almighty. God is worthy of worship that David gives. Uh, uh, God is the owner of it all. He is the creator of the earth. And he says, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Then he says, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. God is worthy of worship because it is by him that the nation of Israel even exists. David is fully aware of God's provisions. He's seen it firsthand. God's, he's seen God's sovereignty. He's seen God reign in his life. He has seen God come through. He has experienced God's provisions. He has experienced God overcoming. He has experienced God guarding, guiding, and saving. He saw God move in his life as he stood before the giant and see him being killed by that one rock with the slingshot, you know? He saw the victory of God. He saw God care and protect him as he hid and ran from King Saul as King Saul tried to kill him. He saw God watch over Israel as Israel's enemies who continually harassed them were finally defeated and held in check by David and his armies. He saw armies larger than Israel's armies defeated and running away because God was fighting for them. He saw God's sovereign hand. He saw that and he knew that the reason Israel existed wasn't because of David's military brilliance or even his leadership, because, but rather because God is sovereign. God has to be worshipped. Israel uh, exists because of God's sovereignty. And didn't the God of Israel 
the God of the universe deserve a house, a place of worship, and more importantly, didn't he deserve to be worshipped? And so when David worshipped God, this was an expression of the nation and the kings. The building called the temple was to be an expression of God's presence and that God was important to Israel. Secondly, God's temple was a sign of God's relationship. David wanted anyone and everyone who came to Jerusalem, foreign or citizen, Jew or Gentile, to know that God was important to him and to the nation and to all the kings of the earth. It is interesting as you read First and Second Kings, the beauty and the height of the temple is during the reign of Solomon. It's after Solomon, when his son Rehoboam becomes king, the kingdom becomes divided. And it's almost, and then the structure of the temple and the, the upkeep of the temple and the beauty of the temple begins to wane. And it's almost a correlation of how the temple is managed and cared for and the spiritual fervor of the people. The temple was to be a place of worship where God resided. It was a tangible place where people could see the manifest presence of God in the lives of the Jews. And they knew that God was among them. They knew that God was in their midst. They knew that God was walking with them and among them. And it demonstrated that God was there and the Jews were his people and he was their God. It's, and it was a picture and a prophetic statement of what we will see in the future in Revelation 21 when we will worship God and see him as he is. He will be our God and we will be his people. As the temple declined and as it became less and less favored, so did the people's faith. And as the people's faith declined, so did the temple. It's an interesting correlation as you read First and Second Kings. The fact that David was building a temple showed that God was there, that he was there permanently. He wasn't moving around in a tent. He was there, and people could go and worship. It was a solid structure. It was no longer a transient in tent, but home where God lived among his people. This temple was to be a statement of how great their God was and is. That is why giving to it was so important and was so public. It was not to be given to privately because their relationship with God was not a private thing but a public statement. Their whole existence of their nation was to be one of worship and a lifestyle of giving. The temple structure was a statement that although there was an earthly king, there was also the true and holy king, God himself. God oversaw Israel, not the king. The king was simply the steward, the servant. God was the Lord. That is why he's to be worshipped and exalted. That, th the truth is, is that God's presence was the transformative life. So I tell you, live in that transformative life. Number three, give to God because he's provider. Let's look at verses 14 through 19. But who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to give as generously as this. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are aliens and strangers in your sight, as, we, as were all our forefathers. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. O oh Lord, our God, as, as for all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and pleased with integrity. All these things have I given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, requirements, and decrees and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. J. Oswald Sanders said, The basic question is not how much our, of our money we should give to God, but how much of God's money we should keep for ourselves. So the first thing we can learn from this, from reading this, is that God owns it all. Amen. One of the truths as we look at this passage is that everything we have is because of God anyway. Everything we have is because of God. We do not give to God of our, our resources, but out of God's resources. We are simply stewards of what he owns. I have, beca I have because God is creator. I have because God is God. I do because God is Lord. All that we can know and experience is because God made it possible. We live because he is the author of life. We work and make money and express our creative expertise because God gave us the talents and the minds that we have so that we can make all things possible. 
that we know. You have a job because God gave you the talent you have to do that job. God has enriched all of us to do and create and express and defend and contend, to help, to serve, to exhort, etc., etc., etc. But if for once you think it's because of you or your talents came from you or that you are the author and creator of all that you do, then you fail to realize the magnitude by which you will fall and the power that you're trying to grab. God owns it all. He is the provider. He is the Lord. He is the creator. We are simply stewards of what God has given to us because God owns it all. Secondly, never forget. Never forget that. David knew that what he has is because God gave it to him. It wasn't because of his brilliance. It wasn't because of his expertise. It was because of God. He was king because God called him. He was not born into the world expected to be king. In fact, he wasn't even invited to the party when Samuel came to anoint a king. They had to go get him. When he was born into the world, no one expected him to be king. But God called him to be king. David also knew that what he was seeing today was an expression of excitement and giving. The people were giving because they too had known the presence and power of God's transformative power. So he says there in verse 18, Keep this desire in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. Keep this desire. How do you keep the desire? You never forget. You never forget what God has done for you. You never forget how, how God is your creator. You never forget that he is the author of life. You never forget that, he, that what you have is because of him. You never forget it. The loyalty of the heart must stay firmly rooted in knowing and seeing the hand of God. They knew by what they gave that God was provider. All that they had was because of him. So they give. So they gave. If they had, it was because of him. And so they gave. And if they gave, God would and could and will and can and continue to provide. If you forget that God is provider, then you will begin to start keeping and hoarding. Now, in a few weeks, as we come here together, we have our annual meeting. And I ask that you pray and you keep the budget in mind. And you put it before you and say, how can we make this a reality together as a community? Because it can't happen with just a few of us. It has to happen with every one of us. And so I ask that you will stand with us. You will pray. You will seek God to see how you and I can make it a reality. Remember, this has to be a community effort. 